Hi, I'm Peter Prevost, and welcome to the screencast for Chapter 12 of Data Science for Water Utilities. In the previous chapter, we looked at the basics of working with time series data. Now we're going to delve a little bit deeper by analyzing anomalies and outliers in this time series data. Now, an anomaly is anything that deviates from the norm. So anything that deviates from the norm is, of course, of interest to anyone managing a, a process such as water treatment. Now, there are various methods available to do this. First and foremost, visual inspection. Many water professionals find anomalies by looking at a graph and then using their experience to work out what is an anomaly. The problem is that is always too little too late because it takes a while to, to process all this data. It's a lot of work. And also, there's a great chance that you miss anomalies because nobody has the time to look at all the different data that's available. Then we can use static thresholds, for example, regulatory limits or physical limits. And that was explained in chapter four and five. Now, in this chapter, we're going to look at some statistical methods. But first, let's have a look at a visual method. So we're opening in the files and the scripts folder, we're opening 12 anomalies. There we go. And in this script, first, we open up some packages or part of the tidyverse. Then we read our trusted water quality data set and filter it by total chlorine. Let's clean this out first, just for, for clarity. Okay, let's do this again. Chlorine, now we have 760 observations of our seven variables for chlorine. So that's a measurement by date for each of the suburbs and the units are always in milligrams per liter. The block box plot is a great way to quickly detect anomalies because it uses a built-in statistical algorithm using the interquartile range an anomaly. So this plot now shows us by suburb the distribution of the chlorine measurements. And we can quickly see that for Merton, Southwall, and Tarnstead, we have some anomalies based on this statistical criterion. By the way, if you want to know more about exactly how that uh, statistical criterion works, you use plot dot file, and then there's a detailed description of exactly how these um, very values are worked out. But let's not dwell on that for now. This plotting, me plotting method is an interesting way to quickly look at some anom anomalies, and clearly Merton might have a bit of an issue. Create a separate data set. We filter the chlorine data set. The suburb equals Merton. And zoom in on our little problem suburb. Well, one way to calculate an outlier is by using a z-score. So the z-score is the deviation is the absolute value of the result minus the mean. So it's the difference between the result and the mean of the overall result, divided by the standard deviation. And a common criterion for an outlier is that if that is larger than three, then perhaps we're looking at an outlier. So what I'm doing here, so the which function gives me the number of all the rows, the numbers of all the rows where this criterion applies. At a vector with the numbers 102 and 106, indicating that for those two values, which are most likely those very high ones up here, they are actually the outliers. So I can now subset my CL Burton data frame with the outliers as the rows. And in my columns, I pick the columns that I want to display. So here's my 1.76 and 1.62 milligrams per liter. in Merton, these two points up here. There's a problem with using the z-score, especially when a distribution is not uh, symmetrical, when it's highly skewed. Let's give you an example. I'm creating here as this. It's a sample of the numbers one in a hundred, 10 times. So if I'm finding that, I'm getting all these 
random number. So that's my distribution just for the sake of it. If I take the mean of that X value, it's 45.3. We expect it to be around 50 because it's a random set of numbers. Now I'm adding infinity to this vector. And if I run the mean of C of the collection of X and infinity, so it looks like this, the mean will be infinity. Now I could, infinity is probably a bit exaggerated. That Let's say I'll make it 10, thousand i'm also getting a very high number but that's not quite fair because that one very high number that outlier is actually dragging the mean away from the actual population now if i do this with the median so the median of my random sample is 35 and if i take the median of this random sample plus an extreme outlier it is 36. So the median is a lot more stable because it takes the middle observation and a few outliers is not going to strongly um, skew those results. So therefore, it's probably more um, useful to use the median absolute deviation from the median, my favorite statistical measure, the MAD. Now, how that is calculated? It's calculated in a way that roughly reflects the standard deviation. And through some statistical analysis, there's a fixed number for a standard distribution of 1.4826. And that's multiplied by the median of the difference between the results and the median. So it's the median absolute deviation from the median. If I calculate this for Merton, that is 0.111. So in other words, that is the equivalence of the standard deviation. Our base package also has a function for this, which is MAD. So if I take MAD result, I should get exactly the same. If we look at the help file for the MAD. It explains the statistical criteria. So it has the constant here, 1.4826, which can be changed. And you can change that if your distribution is skewed, like it's usually the case in water quality data. And to do that, you would use the uh, 75th percentile or the 0.75 quantile. So I'm calculating here. And by the way, by putting the whole expression between parentheses, it will immediately print the outcome. So I don't have to use two lines. So in this case, the P75 for Merton is 0.435. And I can then recalculate the MAD with a constant of one divided by this 75th percentile. And then the MAD is 0 0.17. Compare that with 0 0.11. This shows you that this distribution uh, is skewed as we would expect because our large should be rare. Now, the next step uh, requires a judgment call, just like the Z-score where we use three. Also, in this case, we used we can use three. So for example, if the median of the Merton plus three times the MAD, that's then the limit that I need to be looking for. So anything over 0.61, et cetera, is considered an outlier. But here I'm running the same type of formula, which row has the condition that the absolute difference between the mean and my CL on the score MAD which we uh, calculated in line 40. I determine my outliers. But anomaly detection is, a, is really a classification algorithm. So what I'm going to do now is create a variable, which I'm setting to false. So in CL Merton, I'm creating a new variable, which is false all the time. But for where I detected the outliers, and these are my rows of outliers, I'll make it true. My CL Merton data set now looks something like this. Here's my trusty seven columns of the data set. And for outliers, I have false and the occasional. There we go. There are some, there are some outliers. This data set, I can now start visualizing. I can do it quickly with uh, the base plotting functionality. Now let's make that a little bit bigger. You see here that I plot the result over the date. 
where the data is the CL underscore Merton file and the PCH, the plotting character, is not outlier plus 20. So that's a little function that um, to calculate a character value, which means that if it's true, it's a closed dot, and if it's false, it's an open dot, and the type shall be B, which means it's a line plus a point. So that's the way to do this quickly in the um, base plotting package. And we see here that we have some, some outliers, uh, especially later in the year 2070. So nothing to worry about just yet. Another statistical test is Grubbs test. Now what Grubbs test does, and Grubbs test is built in to, built into the R language, Grubbs test looks at the highest value or the highest and the lowest, and then determines statistically whether that is an outlier. So give me a little bit of space here. So if I say outliers package, which you will need to install before you can use it, then my two semicolons and then Grubbs test for the result, it tells me that there's a, that, um, chances that the highest value of 1.76 is not an outlier is 0 0.01, so 1%, which is within our 5% acceptance criteria. So we, we could suggest, yes, that highest point is definitely an outlier. And within this Grubbs test function, we have a type parameter. And if it's one zero, then we're testing for one outlier, which is the default. And we can also do one, one. That means it tests the highest and the lowest. Now, if we test the highest and the lowest, then the alternative hypothesis that 0.025 or 1.6 are both outliers is one. So in other words, um, we have failed to um, for the conclusion. And because 0.25 is, is a normal value and therefore they're not both outliers. So that's the Grubbs test, but it's only for one or two outliers. You could of course do a test. If it's an outlier, remove it, test again, remove the highest and so on. Another method in time series is by using a run length function, the RLE function. Now, what does a run length do? Before I run this, I'll, I'll shall create an example. Let's say I'm creating a vector, which we'll call um, T, and that vector is one, one, two, two, three, 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 three. If I now do the RLE of T, I get a double outcome. So the run length is two, three, four, which means that, and the values are one, two, three. So the value one occurs twice, the value two occurs three times, and three occurs four times. It is a very good way to compress a, a data vector as well, but we can also use it to detect some anomalies. And this is what we do. Taking the run length, where the chlorine result in Merton is larger than one. If I view this outcome, I see here that my length, there's 80 um, where it's false, and then we have two where it's true. One value where it is false, and four values where it is true, and so on. Again, I can now use this to in my plotting. In this case, I'm using ggplot. The data is CL Merton. I'm plotting by date and results, and the color is an outlier. I'm putting in a gray line, and do some date scaling, increase the point size and have some uh, some gray coloring for outliers, some theming and um, with the legend. So here's my ggplot function using those outliers. So they're nice immediately visible as well. The other thing you could do is scale Color um, annual. There we go. Annual, then values equals 
ret back, which is uh, probably, and then comment this one out. Flip those around because black is zero. No, oh, oh yeah, okay. There we go. Live coding, and this will be another way to show those outliers. But the code in the book um, gives grayscale because that's how the book is printed. That's it for outlier detection. In the next section, we're going to write a function to detect leaks and leak detection. Because another way to detect anomalies is by understanding the physical processes that are underlying the data. And that way, by understanding the physical processes, you can define the conditions that would generate an anomaly. Now, to do that, we can create some functions. I'm going to take you back to the very first case study with the Kins father carter formula, and where we have to repeat the same formula over and over again. Now, the R language is very good at creating your own functions. So I'm creating a function calling channel on the score flow. And then there's the function function name. And the parameters in my function are the H, the height, the B. I'm fixing the CD, and I'm fixing the G. So CD is the discharge constant. Here's the function, and then I'm re returning that value. If I evaluate this, you'll see that in my environment, I now have a function called channels, channel flow, which is a function with these parameters. And I can happily use this to answer the questions from the first case study. I don't have to enter the CD and the G value because they have a constant, but I could uh, also override them. So if I have a channel on mass with a gravity constant is 3.72, that would be, would be my outcome. All you have to do is Type the function name without any parentheses, and I will display you what that function looks like. And the bytecode, which is an internal code that R uses to reference this function. And this is a good way to inspect other functions that come from other packages if you want to be certain how they, how they work statistically. But R also has a lot of primitive functions. So sum, for example. And what you see when you ask for the sum function, it gives you what the structure of the function is, but it says it's a primitive, which means it's compiled in machine language and no source code is immediately available. Variables within a function have their own little environment. So if I say CD is 12 and I'll run the channel flow function, it doesn't really change it. The CD value that I'm using in the function stays within the function, irrespective of whether a variable with that same name exists in the main environment. So each function has its own environment. So also I can say Q is zero and then channel flow, uh, but Q stays zero. There are ways to override this um, and I'll let you reverse engineer this at your own leisure. So now we are ready to write a simple function for leak detection. In the previous chapter, I spoke about the simulated digital metering data. And this is the basic diurnal curve, which came from some literature. The basic diurnal curve that is used for the simulation. And the assumption here is, and here is where domain knowledge becomes very important, that this is a normal household that hasn't got a leak. So in other words, when the people are asleep, no water is being consumed. And then people get up and they have a shower. Some go to work, some stay home, and then there's evening usage and doing the dishes and so on, and then it goes down again. Now, a leak can be defined as any diurnal curve that never hits zero, because a leak is a constant 24 hour flow. And the way to do that is by looking at the flow rate. And if I look over a certain time period, and let's say I'm looking at the whole data set, then there should be at least one or two instances where the flow rate is zero. So the flow rate being the difference between two consecutive observations. So if I want to detect the leaks, I'm taking my meter reads table, 
which I haven't read in memory yet. So let's quickly do that. Meter reads, okay. So I've got my meter reads, which is explained in the previous chapter, but here's my device ID. So a unique device ID for each house, their timestamp and a count and each count equates five liters in this particular example. I'm grouping that by device ID ID because I want to know the leak for each property. And then I'm creating the values. First of all, I'm calculating the time difference. Then I'm calculating the volume and the flow. So the time difference is the timestamp minus the lag of the timestamp. So the time, the lag of a variable within tidyverse is the previous observation. But to make sure that this becomes a number in the number of seconds, I convert it to a numeric. So timestamp minus lag timestamp gives me the time difference except at the start, because there's no zeroth value, and, at, and also at the end, um, I might get a zero. Then the volume is five times the count, minus the lag of the count, and the default is zero. So again, I'm subtracting, in this case, two minus one times five. So it's five liters was used in this period here between, between these hours. Then, once I have that, I can give me the minimum flow for each property. And that minimum flow should be zero, because there should be at least one or two time periods where there was no flow, showing how important it is sometimes to fully understand where your data comes from. So let's run this, and I now have a table with all my leaks. And I know that this is correct, but this, because this is exactly the leaks that I created in the uh, synthetic data. So all these properties have leaks, and this is their minimum flow that goes through their tap 24 hours a day. And we can put that in a function. Let's create a detect leak function. And the only thing I put in there are reads. In other words, that's a vector of reads that I want to be that I want to check. I'm creating that to a table. Then here is my function where I'm creating the volume. And that summarize that volume, and then I pull minimum vo volume. In other words, I only need that value. So that if I run this, and I know, for example, from my leaks table here, I know which properties have a leak. So one five one five seven seven six is in my leak table, and the other one is not. So if I detect leaks, the meter reads count, that's the reads that I'm putting into the function, but only where the device is this particular device, and I get 30. And in this case, here's another property which hasn't got a leak. This chapter, uh, I've shown you some techniques for detecting anomalies, which is looking at it visually, using some statistical techniques. And the last method, the leak detection, is uh, using domain knowledge to work out uh, anomalies. In the next and the last chapter, we're going to introduce uh, machine learning by looking at some complex um, linear regression and also some other algorithms. Uh, thanks for your time.